Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me as always from deep in Nassau County, it's John. John, how psyched are you for season eight? Ah. Uh. Let me rephrase it in a different way. Are you more excited for season eight than any other season of Game of Thrones? I'm going to say no. Really? I'm just really nervous now. Every season, you know. You knew your guy was safe. Yeah, I knew John was safe. Even when he died, you knew he was safe. Even when he died, he was safe. (laughs) (laughs) How funny is that, though? We didn't have any confirmation from George. We had nothing to go off of in the books. But we knew he was fine. Death has been so finite in Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, for the most part, at least point of view deaths. But we knew John would be fine, though we had no evidence to say that he would. Well, we had some, you know, things that were, were in the book, et cetera, et cetera. Theories, yeah. At the time, theories, since proved to be correct since then. Yeah. I don't know. It's just one of those things. It's like you just knew that it was different. It was different from Rob. It was different from Ned. With Ned, we see him die, and it's not his point of view chapter. Well, no. Catelyn dies. It is her point of view chapter. So that doesn't make sense. But she goes back. She does come back. That's true. So then Quentin Martell, that's his point of view chapter. He's only confirmed dead in a, in a non-point of view, though. Right. He's He lives for a little while longer. It's not confirmed. That he, he doesn't die in his point of view. Poor Quentin. Yep. Yeah. Poor, unnecessary Quentin. It's more like it. How about this, John? Would you put Game of Thrones up there as one of your favorite TV shows of all time? Top four. Okay. What are some of the others in the top four? Uh, Seinfeld's my favorite, probably. The Office. The Office. Okay. And then it's, just, it's neck and neck with Battlestar Galactica. Nice. If people say, how come, like, all you do is talk about Game of Thrones. It's still, yes, you can judge compared to the book, so it gets us, you know. Well, plus it's still ongoing. When you started Battlestar, it was over, right? Yeah. The show's done, so what is there to talk about, really? Where's Game of Thrones? Anything could happen. Literally, anything can can still happen. It's a little more than just a TV show, also. It's just different. Yeah. It's a lot different. The world building is a lot different. It's better than Battlestar Galactica as far as world building. I don't know if I'd say the characters in Battlestar Galactica are better than the characters in Game of Thrones. Well, they're not. They're definitely, they're definitely not as deep. I mean, Battlestar Galactica is, you know, it's kind of cheesy and campy. and Yeah. But I think they were similar to Game of Thrones characters in how dimensional they were. Even characters you liked, they did a lot of things that you did not like. Anyway, we're not talking about Battlestar Galactica. We're talking about Game of Thrones. And I think I might agree with you. I have been more excited for seasons past. I think season seven might have been the one I was most excited for. Although that's hard to say. I think I was also really excited for season three, knowing how good, how important Storm of Swords was, Mm -hmm. and knowing that they were going to adapt that personally as far as Song of Ice and Fire. I love the characters that we get introduced to in the second act. You're John Connington's, you're you're on Greyjoy's. I love those characters, and it felt like season three would be a Storm of Swords, and we start to get some of these new and interesting characters. We got some of them. We got Euron. We got Mace Terrell. We got introduced to the larger scope of Westeros. Right. But it wasn't at the expense of the main characters, especially not the eight characters that we're going to begin talking about today. And I was a little bit disappointed in that. And I think that's why I was not excited for season five at all, knowing that John Connington had not been cast. Well, yeah, because that was really, I think when we look back at it, I think everyone said to themselves, if John Connington and Young Griff aren't in season five, they're not going to be in it. Yeah. So I think we all knew if they didn't come into season five, that there's, there'd just be no way, no how, that they would be able to actually incorporate them into the show. And I was very disappointed by that. Now looking back, not that they couldn't have had John Connington in the show, but it would have been difficult, especially introducing fake Aegon Targaryen. It would have just made things 
a lot more difficult for television. It's better the way they did it as far as their adaptation goes, as far as a television adaptation. In hindsight, it all worked out, but at the time, I was disappointed and not excited for season five. I was more excited for season three than season four, but I do think season seven, that excitement level, that was as excited as I got. And while I am excited for season eight, you said nervous, I say more bittersweet. I think I'm a little bit more confident that Jon Snow will survive and see the end of the series than you are. But even if he died, I don't think that would make me nervous about season eight. I think it's just more of a bittersweet thing that it's ending. I'm excited to see it come back, but that also means it's the end. And we talked about it a couple episodes ago, I think, about Lord of the Rings. You don't like watching The Return of the King so much because it's over. Yeah, he had said, like, Mm -hmm. I want to go back and watch the first one. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the first of our main characters that is definitely not universally loved, and that's Cersei Lannister. And if you do love Cersei Lannister, or ever feel bad for Cersei Lannister, just think of Ned Stark having to kill Lady. Your sadness and and, uh, and all that should be wiped out the window. Well, first off, Lena Headey, the perfect casting for Cersei Lannister, or? Definitely acting-wise, yeah. Like, in the book, Cersei's a little more described as a little more elegantly beautiful. Yes. Younger. More youthful looking, yeah. Right. Not taking any away from Lena Headey, I mean. Absolutely not. I wouldn't date her, though. Oh, dude, she killed me. She kicked my ass. Yeah. yeah. I'd, be, I'd be scared of her. Yeah, exactly. Like, Lena Headey being one of those, like, do I hold the door being a gentleman? Or if I hold right. the door, she'd be, that's like, you know. Right. What do I do? I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. Yeah. Either way, she's going to hate me, possibly kill me. You know. Swooping crane shot yeah. in the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that being said, it does make sense with the rest of the casting and how Benioff and Weiss really had to up everybody's age. Mm-hmm. Something even George has said that if he had to go back to rewrite things, he would write them a little bit older. You know, he should be careful because some people may go back and read his books and he may get a Me Too moment. Yeah, see, I'm surprised he hasn't already. But he, uh-huh. he, 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 he would probably be the one who would make the complaint about himself. Yeah. <laughs> he's that type of, he's another one of the, you know, like, oh, me too. Oh, one power. You shouldn't really read the books because, you know, there's instances of, of underage kids ha- in sexual relations. I never meant for this book to be as popular as it was. <laughs> yeah. I think we should all forgive me for this. Because I've grown as a writer. Cersei Lannister, season one. I was trying to think back. You're probably going to ask the same question I have right now. What did you think of her in the first shot that you saw her? That is is pretty much where I was going. Um, We get a little bit of a heads up with her based on the conversation between Catelyn and Ned. That Ned doesn't like her. Mm-hmm. But technically, we don't we don't know what to think of Ned yet. And I'm trying to look at this through the eyes of someone that hasn't read a Game of Thrones prior to watching Game of Thrones. And I think with the casting of Lena Headey, she's got this natural scowl to her, the big eyebrows, and she's a beautiful woman. You know, you see pictures of her smiling, having fun. She's a beautiful woman. But as Cersei Lannister, she maintains this passive aggressive face or, or aggressive face. And that's the, the first we see of her. I do think you kind of get, not turned off by her, but you do get the vibe that she is not necessarily a good guy. Right. I agree. One thing that struck me was, I just knew something was up already, and it not be really because of her face, but you look at her and you, you see like this, I mean, you know, you see this, you know, this queen all, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you see Robert Baratheon, and you just try like, what the hell is she doing with this guy? Right. You know, here's this out of, out of shape, beer guy can hardly get off the horse, or, right. you know. And and he's kind of an idiot, too. Yeah. like Just like a right. blustering, pompous moron. So, like, right there, you knew something was up. You, mm-hmm. you just knew something. There was a dynamic there that there's reasons for everything here, and there's something going on there. There's no way. And for lack of a better word, you get the feeling that Robert Baratheon is somewhat one-dimensional. Mm-hmm. A blustering, bold, shouting, big-ass beer belly. But, like, that's him. Like, that doesn't necessarily make him evil. It just makes him an idiot. And then you see Cersei, and it's like, all right, so what is she doing with this guy? Because there's no way this guy has, like, a charismatic, like, suave side to him. He is what he is. This guy yelling in the yard. You already feel that there's a, some sort of a split between them. Like a rift. A division. Right. I get what you're saying. A wall between them, really. This is not, you know, a lovey-dovey marriage. Yeah. 
And Benny Elfenweiss are successful in bringing it to the forefront in their first scene. First, they're not riding in the coach together. You know, mm-hmm. Robert rides in on a horse, and that's really right. the, only, <laughs> the only time you see the guy get on a horse throughout the six episodes he's in, or really doing much of anything physical. And, then, and they set it up also, too, like right away when Robert tells Ned, Ned to the Crips, and then she's already, she's already saying, do we have to, you know, like... Yeah. Yeah. And he just looks at her like, this is more important than you. Winter's Coming is a great pilot episode. We do have to keep in mind it was the second attempt at the pilot episode, so they got to redo a lot of things, but they were off to the races with Winter's Coming. I think with Cersei, it works well with her in season one. I think we get the vibe of who she is, but we just don't realize how cunning she is. And not that we're dismissive of her as an antagonist, as, as a heel. But we don't realize what she's capable of prior to Robert's death, which is, it is episode six, I believe, that Robert dies. Yeah, episode six. We get a few key scenes with Cersei prior to Robert and the boar incident. And we get that beautifully written scene with Cersei and Robert at the table, which is a non-book scene. That's one of their better scenes that they've really... An original Benioff and Weiss scene, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> they should have put it. <laughs> they should have put it like, in, during the during the scene. Yeah. <laughs> Original piece by T and D. Just like on the bottom scroll or something. <laughs> An original Benny Off and Weiss joint. <laughs> uh, but we get we get more of those because we also have the c- the scene with Joffrey, and we also have a scene with Lancel. These are only things that are hinted at in a Game of right. Thrones. You're going back right. to the Robert scene. Were you going to say something about the, the scene with Robert? Just, just real quick. I don't want to go to the books too much, but you know, after seeing the first two seasons, I read the books. When I read them, again, I had to kind of like remember which scenes were not only cut from the books, but which scenes of the show add. Mm-hmm. I always thought that that scene with Robert and Cersei was actually a scene really in the books, but it wasn't. That's how well-written it was. It could have fit so easily into the books. Listen, all the praise to Benioff and Weiss for that. I've knocked them a lot in the past. I think I've grown to appreciate them a lot more the last couple seasons. Looking back at the whole of their work with this series, those scenes that weren't from the book, but inspired by events of the book and what you assume is going on that's not in the point of view character's chapter, these scenes, you can fit most of them flawlessly into the book. And the one with Robert and Cersei, not only can it fit into the book, but it's almost like a tender moment for them. And you almost see if there were happy years in their marriage, which Cersei says in Feast for Crows, there were a couple happy years for them, or maybe not years, a couple happy months, or maybe a happy fortnight, whatever it was. There was a happy time. There was a time when she was happy in her marriage with him. You can kind of see why in that scene. And they're both being honest with each other. I think it's both characters at their best. And then we also have the scene with Joffrey. Everybody is our enemy is pretty much the message they're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Joffrey, so you agree, the Starks are our enemy. And Cersei says, anybody that's not us is our enemy. And that's a mantra that Cersei Lannister carries throughout the series. Mm -hmm. Stays with her. Yeah. But I don't know how true it is. We'll talk more about that later. But she's almost at Catelyn Tully levels of bullshitting herself and the people around her as to what her priorities really are. And I think another key scene somewhat is the scene with Lancel, because that stuff is hinted at in the books, and it's brought to the forefront by Tyrion in conversations with Lancel. But they can't do that in the show. They have to show her with Lancel. Lancel Lannister. <laughs> what kind of name is Lancel? Oh, God. Ugh. <laughs> um, Lancel's such a weak, sniveling character, so you wonder why Cersei... You forget the aspect that it's her cousin, but you wonder why Cersei would ever be with somebody like that. I don't think it makes too much sense in season one, but getting to know the character Cersei, how much she drinks, it makes more sense. She probably got really drunk and he looks a little bit like Jamie. She felt like she had power over him. So it kind of does make more sense. But I think it's a good moment for her character in the TV show because it shows a little bit of weakness in a character that refuses to ever show weakness. So I think those are the three most important Cersei scenes prior to Robert dying. And then I think her biggest scene, actually, before we get to that, going back to Winter's Coming, the reveal, the last scene when Bran discovers Jamie with Cersei, 
What was your initial reaction to that? Oh, boy. Did you expect it? Had you heard anything about it? No. No. I can't remember my, my full thoughts on that. I, I remember like a little bit of hatred for Jamie pushing his kid out the window. Yeah. But I can't think back to what I felt about Cersei and Jamie together like that. Yeah, as far as like surprises and reveals go, it's is very well intentioned. The reason I think it doesn't work as like, a holy shit moment is because the holy shit moment is when he pushes Bran out the window. Mm-hmm. Actually finding out that it's Cersei that Jamie is having sex with. When I read the book, it's so hard to keep track of those characters. I don't think I realized that Jamie was her twin brother. The name Jamie I knew, Cersei I knew. I don't think I realized it. it took me a little bit to process it. So it wasn't a holy shit moment reading the book. I think as far as a TV show, it's easier, obviously, to know that, that they're twins. And I'm sure people were like, whoa. But I think when Bran gets pushed out the window, that's the holy shit moment. And it overshadows the reveal that these twins, they practice incest. Going back to her meeting with Ned, or going forward rather, to her meeting with Ned in the Godswood, I would say either that or the throne room scene later on is the key scene for Cersei in season one. I'm going to say the throne room because we, at the point with Ned, it starts, you, you don't know really what the conclusion of that's going to be. And then we see that in the throne room that, okay, Ned tried to, <laughs> tried to think he was going to win this by threatening her about, you know, Robert's wrath. But then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> there's a new king now. I think when she says that, it's like, oh. And we can't forget, you said it in our primer episode for this series on characters, Cersei demanding that Sansa's direwolf be killed, even though Lady was not responsible for attacking Joffrey. Right. Don't ever, ever feel bad for Cersei. Never. Well, is there any part of you logical side? I know you love dogs. I love dogs too. I don't approve of it, but is there any part of you that understands her thought process nope. or her- Nope. She just wanted to see pain and them suffer, so she had to do something. I agree, but I also think it's a saving face thing for her. I think Robert was at a point where he would have killed Nymeria, but they say the dog is lost, so he says, well, there you go, I don't have to do it. But I think if the dire wolf was around, I do think Robert would have had it killed. I think he would have decided that. That would have been his ruling. Ned pleads to Robert saying, you know, is this your command, your grace? But I think Ned understood. He didn't agree with the justice. Maybe he wouldn't have called it justice. But Ned does end up killing Lady, so he understood the command. It wasn't something he was going to rebel against. I don't know if I quite give it a pass, and I definitely don't think that Cersei was right, but I do have a better understanding of it thinking back on it. Did you at all think Cersei was capable of outmaneuvering Ned based on the Godswood scene? Possible, because Ned was just giving out the whole entire plan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so see here is the blueprints of what I'm going to do. Okay. I made you a list of where I will be, what hour I will be there at. Right now we're on to part two of this, so you just cross out part <laughs> one. And I made you a backup copy if you make a mistake. Not that I did because I read the book, but I could see somebody actually feeling a little, a little bit of pity for Cersei in that scene based on Robert hitting her, based on her love for her children. I could see somebody identifying with her a little bit. Just a little bit. And I think that's one of Cersei's strengths is she doesn't say anything to lie to somebody outright. Not in a situation like that, but she doesn't say anything to give herself away. She processed everything Ned was saying and she easily outmaneuvered him. But I don't, I know for a fact, I didn't think she was capable of what she did. And by capable, I mean, I didn't think she had the skills to outmaneuver Ned at that point in time. But she does easily. And that throne room scene, when Ned shows up, that is such a great scene. I love that scene. Probably one of the best in season one. That's great. I did tell you not to trust me. Yeah. A lot of it is Ned's fault. Cersei's victory, it gives her a little too much confidence, which she immediately pays for because her plan, along with the small council that decided to side with her instead of Ned, is to have Ned take the black or give him that option to take the black. They assume that that's something that he will do. If given that option, I think Ned would do that. His options were watch Rob march south and go to war 
or to take the black, I think he would take the black. Oh, definitely. He would. He would want. He would want to have to have his kid go down there. He knows how what it's that like it is in King's Landing. He know he knows the treachery of the lashes already because mm-hmm. of what Tywin did, and he knows everything that you know everything that happened in, in Robert's rebellion when he marched south. So, a little what if if things had worked out and Ned took the black, does that end the very young War of the Five Kings? Which wasn't a War of the Five Kings yet. It was just a war between the Lannisters. Well, basically between the Lannisters and the Tullys at that point. Do you think that ends the fighting if Ned takes the Black? See, I, I can't get out of my head that I think Rob still does something that will cause a war. Yeah. Well, if Ned's alive and he takes the Black and they have Sansa and Arya as hostages, which they don't have Arya at that point, but as far as Rob knows, I don't know. I don't know. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. I feel like Ned's death is what really pushes Rob to march. Well, at that time, they were already going. They were already marching. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So they were already at war. So what is he going to do? Just pack up and go back north? I'm sure there would have been a contingency. Lord Stark, you could take the black if you can convince your son to pack up and head back north. But that's not all that they would need. They would also need Rob to come south and bend the knee. That'd be another condition. So you're probably right. It probably wouldn't have worked anyway. Logistically, it wouldn't have worked. There would still be war. Mm-hmm. Balon Greyjoy would still take advantage of it. Renly. Renly would still have declared himself King Stannis. You know, he don't give a shit. What's going on? Robert's dead. He's king. But I guess the more important thing as far as Cersei and the character is that that was their plan to have Ned take the black. But Joffrey makes his own decision in this moment. Right, because so Cersei's thinking about Jamie. Cersei's thinking, okay, I would personally would have already killed Jay. You know, if, if they killed Ned, I would kill Jamie. Right. Like look at back on it, they should have done that. How everything worked out, yeah, they should have done that. But when Joffrey beheads Ned, Cersei was just as surprised as everybody else. Nobody saw that coming. As far as the small council, as far as Cersei, from there it's, it's damage control, and the war just escalates. That's pretty much how we end with Cersei in season one. She gets this power trip from outmaneuvering Ned and taking control of the Iron Throne, becoming Queen Regent. She also realizes she has far less control than she thought because Joffrey is not going to just listen to whatever she says. Mm -hmm. And that it sort of deepens in season two, another Benioff and Weiss original joint where her and Joffrey have a conversation. I believe it's in the throne room. Joffrey's doing a little bit of redecorating. He tells his mother that he heard the rumors about her and Uncle Jamie. She slaps him and he says, you will not do that again or I'll have you thrown in the dungeons or something to that effect. Cersei realizes she has no control over Joffrey. Joffrey's going to do what Joffrey wants. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because Joffrey's so outright in his refusal to listen to Cersei, but she lives and dies by Joffrey. She thinks the world of Joffrey, even after his death, when Tom and his king, Joffrey would never have done that. Joffrey was fierce. Joffrey was brave. Yeah, like all this. Yeah, it's all BS, but she thinks so highly of Joffrey. So season two, I said this to you off air that I didn't realize. In A Song of Ice and Fire, it's Cersei that orders the death of all of Robert Baratheon's bastards. In Game of Thrones, they make it that Joffrey has ordered the death of all of Robert Baratheon's bastards. Why do you think Benioff and Weiss chose to go that route? Why the switch? Did they just want to show that Joffrey was gay? He's the king. He's the one making the decisions. That's possible. That's possible. I also think that, I think it's sort of along the lines with- You don't want a female get out of orders to kill kids. Yeah. I think that's closer to it, but I think it's also yeah. kind of why they made some changes to Tyrion in the TV show. You know, yeah, so yeah, that- they, Yeah, that they made Tyrion more likable. Right. And not that you can make Cersei more likable, but some people do view her as a sympathetic character- to a certain extent, and I feel like her ordering the death of like babies, it's tough because she's she's already a heel. She's already an antagonist. She's already like the number one bad guy by the time we get to season two. Yeah, she's definitely top three. She's top three. I feel like her ordering the death of babies, that's that's going a little bit little bit overboard. It works in the books. On the TV show, it might have worked, but I think it works better that Joffrey makes that decision, just because it's such a heinous decision to make. 
on the book Cersei does that, it's more out of spite for Robert. Whereas in the in the TV show, they make it more like Joffrey's doing that to protect his claim, so nobody comes out of the woodwork saying they're Robert's son. Not that a bastard would have a right to the throne. But it's just paranoia on Joffrey's part. Whereas in the books, it's anger on Cersei's part. I mean, season two, the main of Cersei's story is her rivalry and her political maneuvering with her brother Tyrion. So why was Tyrion sent to King's Landing in the first place? Well, why, why do you think? I mean, Tywin says he needed someone there to try to calm his grandson. Right. To bring Joffrey to heel, I think is the way they put it. He's being advised by Lick Spittles and, how does he put it? Lick Spittles or people with their own agendas. And think of Lick Spittles, Grand Maester Pycelle. And people with their own <laughs> agendas, you got Varys and Littlefinger. Tywin's in a tough spot at that point in time. Jamie is lost to them. Whether he's dead or he's in a dungeon, he's off the board. Tywin can't go to King's Landing because if he goes to King's Landing, that opens up the entirety of the Riverlands for Rob Stark. Mm -hmm. Maybe he could have sent Kevin, but he decides to send Tyrion because he does recognize that Tyrion has a mind, if not for warfare, for ruling. He knows that him and Cersei Pai don't get along. So that would actually work in his favor than saying Kevin, where Kevin might just be more of a yes man. Or get turned into a yes man. You know what? Kevin kind of is, he kind of is a yes man. And he's also Tywin's right hand man. So I guess that's why you can't send Kevin. He needs him to be his yes man. <laughs> we're all like, we're all holy slanders. We need yes men around us. Yeah. When Tyrion arrives at King's Landing, Cersei's pissed because she's not expecting that. Other than Jamie, her and Tywin don't have much respect for Tyrion at all. So it's, it's probably a surprising move. For her. Right. She doesn't believe it at first. Then Tyrion shows her Tywin's letter, and she, she gets angry at Tywin. And understandably so. She thinks she's in the driver's seat, even though it doesn't appear to the audience that she is. She thinks she is still. And then all of a sudden, Tywin sends Tyrion, of all people, and it's pretty much a vote of, a vote of no confidence in her by her mm -hmm. own father. Right. I think the thing I was trying to go for a little bit before was, it's like I'm saying Tyrion down. I know you don't get along with him. So, I know you so think I'll, he's an idiot. <laughs> right. So I'll basically do this as a slap in the face to you. Right. I said I he's an idiot. And being run right now. So I'm going to send a person down there that you don't like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. I, I, can't really, I can't really put in the words, but I, I just feel that that was part of it. Yeah. The best laid plans of, of mice and men. We've done it before. The bigger plan of House Lannister and how they all kind of, at least at the beginning, had the intention to work together in, in sync with each other, even though they're all in different locations. It did seem that Tywin and Cersei were working in cahoots and they had similar plans. But what else does Cersei do in season two prior to Blackwater? She she charges Littlefinger with finding Arya, but I, I felt like that, that scene was not super necessary, mm -hmm. except that it gets Littlefinger out on the road. There's no Jaime for Cersei in season two. It's almost like Lancel becomes her most trusted ally at King's Landing. I know the yes man. Uh-huh. And there are moments when Tyrion and Cersei do work well together, but it all comes to a head when Tyrion makes an alliance with Dorne. Oh, yes. Forgot about that. I forgot that was season two. Politically, it's a good move to secure that relationship, especially when Dorne is so angry with House Lannister because of the death of Ilya. I don't want to go on the Tyrion spout, because we'll say that for Tyrion, but it really is a bad move. And he's made a lot of bad moves. It seems like a good move, but why do you think it's a bad move? Let's start with that. Why is it a bad move, move to you? He underestimates the Martell's lust for revenge. Yes. Yeah, he does. He does. But hindsight 2020, knowing where this storyline goes, it's not Doran Martell that wants to kill Marcella. He doesn't want to kill Marcella. It's good for him to take advantage, to get closer to the Lannisters, to get closer to power in King's Landing, because he's also offered a spot on the small council, a spot that he gives to his brother. And then it gets tricky because Doran Martell, Game of Thrones, Doran Martell, Song of Ice and Fire are completely different Doran Martells. Doran is completely different. It really is tough to tell. Basically, he's not nearly as wise as he is in A Song of Ice and Fire. He wanted to destroy House Lannister. At least he says he does. You mm -hmm. know, Oberyn did. But are they capable of killing children, even to get revenge against a house that killed children that were part of their family? 
I don't know. I don't know if Dorne Martell's capable of that. Oberyn, I do. I do think Oberyn, especially in the book series, is capable of that. But Dorne, I don't know. All that being said, Tyrion is taking a big gamble with sending Princess Marcella to them, especially making a marriage pact with Tristane. Because if things fall the right way, it, it may end up where Tristane is, if not the ruler of Westeros, in his marriage to Marcella, which mm-hmm. is not likely but possible. Dorne is very close to the Iron Throne by marriage and an alliance between House Lannister, even though it's House Baratheon, but House Lannister and House Martell, it's, it's a dangerous thing. And Cersei sees this, and you got to give credit to Cersei here. She knows who her enemies are, and she's not willing to take a gamble. She's not willing to ask for forgiveness. Yeah, and she's she, like, you, know, you ransom my daughter off. Right, and that's what it is to her. She makes the case that it's her daughter, you took my daughter from me. I think in later seasons, we learn that family is not as important to her as she says it is. But at that point in time, she's making the argument that you took my daughter from me. And it does end in her death, though not intentioned by House Martell outright. It does end in Marcella's death. So it turns out Cersei was right. She follows this up by <laughs> by kidnapping who she thinks is Shay, but oh, it's not actually. God. I just can't stand her. You can't stand her, and I can't stand Roz either. Yeah. I guess Roz is a little more. Yeah, at least Shay plays a little more of a role to the story, where Roz is just yeah. throwing. And eventually the character goes nowhere anyway. He just right. like, gets shot with an arrow by Joffrey. <laughs> Many uh, of the dire old scenes were cut out because they had to pay Roz 10 yeah. episodes. Right. She was like a main character for a couple episodes. <laughs> so anyway, it's not Shay, it's Roz that she kidnaps and. <laughs> Roz is like all bruised. And Tyrion's like, I'll, I'll make sure you get out of here. Whatever he says. Roz is like, yeah, <laughs> please get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but Shay's safe at the manse. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into Shay, I guess, more when we talk about Tyrion. But <sighs> definitely the weakest part. The book and, and TV yeah. show, the weakest part of... One of the weaker parts of the whole series is Shay. So a couple things with the Blackwater episode. Unless you can think of something else with her in season two leading up to Blackwater. It's really just her trying to control Joffrey and competing with Tyrion for who's really ruling the Iron Throne from King's Landing. Yeah, there's nothing that really sticks out that's like, oh, that's such a pivotal scene. Not until Blackwater. She thinks she's going to die, but she's all set to die. I was trying to remember, and I don't know if you can remember, I do know that Tyrion had a plan to send Tommen to Rosby. It's in the Crown Lands, probably the closest main keep to King's Landing. And he wanted to send Tom in there before Stannis reached King's Landing because he knew if they took King's Landing, God forbid they kill him and Cersei and Joffrey, mm-hmm. having Joffrey's heir away from the castle, that's the best way to go. When you do finally read Fire and Blood, you'll see that when there's war, Crown is threatened, you split up the heirs. You put them in different spots because you don't know how the ball is going to bounce. And- being able to produce an heir out of your back pocket, that's a good thing to have. You keep all your eggs in one basket, it's easier for your enemies to win. Well, obviously, the Mad King doesn't think about that kind of type of uh Who, the thinking. Mad King? No, he, well, he kind of does because he sends he sends his wife and Viserys. Yeah, true. Viserys, yeah, he sends them away. But that's that's like at the 12th hour. And it didn't, it didn't do much good. But at least the thought was there. You don't want to give them the ability to eliminate your house all in one, one swoop, one swooping crane shot. Tyrion doesn't do that in the TV show. It doesn't make sense that he doesn't do it, but at the same time, that scene with Cersei and Tommen on the Iron Throne to end Blackwater, that's probably the highlight of season two for me. I mean, the battle was great. Stas is going up there with no helmet on. Right. That's, that's like a little bit. Just, <laughs> and just everybody comes out, he just kills him. Yeah. They're throwing um, rocks down and all, and like yeah. Stas there, no helmet at all. He's dodging all the rocks. He gets up there first. It's not even like he's like he's the first guy up and over. Yeah, he's so stubborn and thick-headed that the rock won't even affect him. Ah, uh, dude, bounce right off. I can give that stuff a pass, but we know a king is not going anywhere near the front lines. If he is, he's definitely wearing a helmet. Yeah, the king's not going to be the first guy up a ladder, and especially a guy like Stannis, who has a great mind for warfare. That doesn't mean he's a great warrior. But in Game of Thrones, he was a great warrior and did not have a great mind for warfare. But still, the battle was the battle was great, especially considering the budget they had was not near what they have now. 
that scene on the Iron Throne when she thinks it's the enemy that's breaking into the throne room and she has the vial of Widow's Tears or Tears of Lice and she's about to make Tommen drink it. They probably wouldn't kill Tommen, but she'd rather Tommen be dead than a prisoner to Stannis right. Baratheon. Do you think Stannis would have killed Tommen? He would definitely kill Cersei. He would definitely kill Tyrion. Definitely kill Joffrey. I don't know if he would kill Tommen though, especially not with Tywin Lannister still out on the field. I think he would have. That's cold. I mean, he's capable of it. Especially if Mel Sandra around. Oh, Mel Sandra would have. Yeah, he would have burned him. He would have burned <laughs> <Yeah>. him up. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of do it, do this. <laughs> yeah. He would kept him around for like a really good burning when he really needed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> keep him in a back pocket for like a really good, really good sacrifice to a lore. But that scene's great. Tywin comes in. The battle is over. We have won. And then we get the national performing the reigns of Castamir. A great episode. I showed you what Benioff and Weiss were capable of. It was like the first real battle scene that we actually saw. Like right. the first real fighting that we actually saw. Right. And again, on a low budget. Lena Headey's performance as Cersei throughout was solid. Marjorie arrives at King's Landing in the final episode, but you don't really get into her feud with Cersei in that episode. It's one scene. And obviously, Cersei realizes the necessity of that marriage alliance because House Lannister doesn't win the War of the Five Kings without the help of House Tyrell. No. Nope. So the only other thing I wanted to mention about season two is Sir Mandon Moore's mm -hmm. attempt to kill Tyrion. It's discovered that Cersei told him to do that. Book and show, that's never sat well with me. Not that Cersei's not capable of it. But why? Why, right? Why? After the battle, he's still alive, but he's not hand to the king anymore. And her father's there. And maybe she didn't know that'd be the case. I guess you can justify it. It just never sat well with me. It still doesn't. It's just like unnecessary. And it's not quite like her ordering the deaths of babies that were bastards for Robert Brathian, but it's kind of along those lines. It's like a little bit too edgy for who she is. Season three and season four, more so than any two seasons, companion seasons in that season three is about the demise of House Stark mm -hmm. and season four is more the demise of House Lannister. So Cersei's not really, from my recollection, Cersei's not really at the forefront of season three. No. There's no main scene that she has. She's kind of meandering, going in circles just to keep her relevant. You have the Marjorie cersei feud, but the Tyrion-Cersei feud, that's died down a lot. It's like Cersei won that in season two. It's like, Tyrion, you, you're going to mess with me again. I'll get someone else to chop off your head. <laughs> You're master of coin now, so you don't really have a say in the day-to-day -day rule of King's Landing. Plus, Tywin's here, so I don't really have a say in it either. <laughs> Marjorie arrives, and she attempts to alienate Joffrey from Cersei. She does this more so with Tommen, but she starts to try to do it with Joffrey. You get that scene when Joffrey goes out. He's, like, waving to the people. Oh, yeah. God. He's so on Joffrey-like. Yeah. It's like, that's like so cringeworthy when Joffrey's like, I love doing all these terrible events, you know, wherever he said it was just so right. bad. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Leeson was great. Perfect Joffrey. But I guess the main plot point for season three with Cersei is when Tywin learns about House Tyrell's plot in Game of Thrones to marry Sansa to Loras. And Loras, side note, from season two, it looks like we're going to get Loras Tyrell from A Song of Ice and Fire, but season three onward, I don't even think he picks up a sword. He's not Loras Terrell. He's like some combination of the three Terrell brothers from the books. I understand it, but it does kind of kill the character. <laughs> there was only like one sword play that he was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the only sword play he was doing. <laughs> well, there was that one scene when uh, when he gets arrested, what, season five? Wherever it was, season six. Oh, yeah. He was, prax he was practicing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tywin learns of that plot. He acts quickly and he marries Sansa to Tyrion instead. But to make amends with House Tyrell, because Tywin understands how important that alliance is, he offers Cersei mm -hmm. to Loras, which she doesn't like at all. But Tywin's like, well, that's tough. You, you will marry again. Yeah. You will stop these rumors, these false rumors that I know are true. But I'm not going to acknowledge it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a lie if you believe it. Tom Zarek. Or no, that's that's George Costanza. George Costanza. <laughs> <laughs> a lot like Tom Zarek in his thinking. <laughs> It's not a lie if you believe it. Good move by Tywin, but Cersei is not happy with that decision. If anything, 
Cersei hates to be owned. She hates that she feels like property of somebody else, that as a wife, she's property. To her own father, she's property. And this is the case for all noble women. It's not like Cersei's the only noble woman who doesn't have a say in how her life goes. For Cersei, she won't accept it. And this furthers the rift between her and her father. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because she puts her father on such a pedestal and she views her father as one of the great minds of Westeros. And he is. He's one of the great rulers of Westeros, whether you like him or not. He, he knows how to rule over people and he knows how to do it and keep peace. And he knows to use his military strength when he has to. But if he can avoid it, he's going to avoid it no matter the cost. Every decision he makes, it's for the good of House Lannister, but it also is for the good of the people as a whole. The Red Wedding is a horrible, horrible thing, but it did save a lot more lives than it cost. Mm -hmm. So she's right to put him on a pedestal, but she's very angry at him that she has to be one of the pawns that he uses. I was, I was just going to use that word pawn. Well, yeah. like The very reason she puts him on a pedestal is because, of, is because he's capable of making a decision like he's making about her. Yes, that's about it for season three. In season four, it starts pretty strong for Cersei's storyline, at least. Purple Wedding is, what, episode two or episode mm -hmm. three? Yeah, episode two, right? Episode two. And Joffrey appears like completely out of control at this point, and then especially at his wedding. Yeah. He's like almost near, near satanic now. Yeah. His power. Especially after having a few drinks. But she's not making any attempt to control him. She's just like letting him loose. It's almost like her hands-off approach to Joffrey is a way to protest Tywin's hands-on approach to her. Right. You know? Yeah. In the end, I think this makes Tywin look a lot smarter than she is. I mean, there's reasons why I was so hands-on. Joffrey drinks his poison. He dies. It's a horrible death scene. I did feel sympathy for Cersei watching her son die, you know, right in front of her face. Nothing she could do about it. Here's something you mentioned before, how like the similarities between Catelyn and Cersei. Well, here's another one. Right away, let's just blame someone just to blame someone. No evidence whatsoever at the moment. <laughs> just it's Tyrion. You he did, did this. It. He just killed your king. Arrest him. And he's arrested. That's how justice worked. And during the trial, Cersei, she does manipulate the witnesses to speak against Tyrion, including mm -hmm. Shay. But before the trial... I don't know if we ever really went in depth with it. And not that I want to go totally in depth with it now, but the scene of Jamie and Cersei in the Sept of Baelor with Joffrey laid out on the table or whatever it is, a lot of people call that scene rape. And I guess if you look at it from a point of view, you could say it's rape, but I never got that vibe. I don't know what your thoughts are. I think that's a little too PC mm -hmm. to call it rape. The debate over that. At the very least, it was an interesting time because Game of Thrones, its viewership had grown so much that a scene like that was able to spark that kind of debate in the pop culture public sphere. I don't think it was rape. I don't think you think it was rape, but it's interesting that it got such a heated debate. It was definitely like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's awkward. <laughs> yeah, tacky. Mm -hmm. Now it's not the time. Oh, yes, it is. We'll get into it more next time when we talk about Jamie, but it does add to the confusion and the difficulty that Benioff and Weiss have with the character of Jamie. You turned me on to it. He's so back and forth once he returns to King's Landing. But the whole storyline with Jamie in season three, he returns, I'm sorry, in season four, he returns at the end of season three, and she seems happy to see him, but she doesn't change at all with him being back. She's still the same Cersei. It's Jamie that's changed. But then he does he does so many things that are not in agreement with the direction that his character went in during season three. You know what I'm saying? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. He's wishy-washy. He's like a flip-flopper. Leah Dama. Yeah. He, yeah. Every episode, he's got a new point of view on something. Oh, my God. And he lives and dies by every ideal that he has. <laughs> he gets one person's point of view. He's like, this isn't right. Tyrion chooses trial by combat, and we get introduced to the third version of the mountain that rides, Sir Gregor Clegane. Gregor Clegane reboot. <laughs> A reboot, reboot. Cersei chooses him for her trial by combat. Tyrion, Bronn says no. Jamie can't fight for him. And Do you think Jamie with two hands would be a good fight against the mountain? I think he'd beat him, yeah. Well, actually, I don't know. It's tough. I think- He's just so big. 
I think Jamie with two hands in the Jamie with two hands mindset might not have, but I think Jamie with two hands in the Jamie with one hand mindset would beat him because I think you know, he starts to use his, his head a lot more when he loses his sword hand and he used it a lot less when he had them both. I think Jamie season one, it would have been a good matchup, but I think the mountain would have overpowered him. I think Jamie season six, season seven, if he had his sword hand, I think he would have beat him because I think he would have used his head more. At least I like to think that. It's one thing to be the best swordsman in Westeros is another thing, the size of the mountain. Oberyn Martell offers his services up. What do we get from the relationship between Oberyn Martell and Cersei Lannister through season four? Yeah, they do not trust each other at all. Yeah. We know they had a few scenes off the air also, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, long-lasting scenes. <laughs> Those all fair scenes, man. The trial by combat, the result, I think, gives Cersei another boost to her confidence. It looks like Oban Martell is going to defeat Gregor, but he makes a huge tactical error yeah. in just putting his face anywhere near that guy when he should have just killed him. Yeah. Did he really need to hear him say, <laughs> Ilya Martell? <laughs> what was more important, to hear the name or get killed? <laughs> he was doing his Nigo Montoya impression. His head gets crushed. Which is an awesome seed. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Ober Martell was an incredibly popular character. Yeah. Well, especially for how short a time he was around. And especially who the character is based on. The book character is a lot more unsavory than the TV show character that was presented. Benny F. and Weiss, they did a good job adapting him. I just feel there were time constraints with his character. He wasn't there in episode one of season four. I think it was like episode two or three that he showed up. And he was gone by episode what eight or nine? No, he was no, he was he was at the wedding. He was so he was he got introduced in season episode one. Did he? Yep. He was around at most eight episodes, nine mm-hmm. episodes at most. So they had time constraints as far as his character is concerned. And it's okay. They they did a decent job of representing him on the time that they had him. His character would have benefited from a few more episodes at least. There are more dimensions to his character, although I feel like they're darker sides to him that kind of get glossed over. Oberyn Martell is killed, and Cersei gets another boost to her confidence because she knows that Tyrion is now going to be killed and pay Mm -hmm. for the death of Joffrey. She marches in on Tywin and outright refuses to marry Ser Loras. She even threatens Tywin that if he continues to insist that she marries Loras, she's going to go public with her and Jaime, knowing that Tywin wouldn't be able to stand the embarrassment that would come along with that. God, kill him. Her anger, it is what it's been, her anger at Tywin. I think it's just her confidence with winning that trial by combat. Oh, she's feeling salty. So she refuses to be a pawn in her father's Game of Thrones anymore. She wants to be a player. She plays the card she has in her back pocket, which is the truth about her and Jamie. I guess she figures that their hold on the Iron Throne is enough where if that truth was known to the realm... They'd still be able to hold it. They'd still be okay but her father wouldn't be able to deal with the embarrassment of that. Tywin rebuffs her threat, but she's confident that she'll win out. We don't find out what happened, obviously. Another ace in a hole for Cersei. Yeah. But what do you think if Tyrion didn't kill Tywin? Ooh. Well, that just sets up a whole different story level, you know what I'm saying? So let's say Tywin's alive and he lets Tyrion take the black, for argument's sake. They still need that alliance with House Tyrell. Right. That that would probably really piss off Cersei even more that he's letting him live. I could see a situation in which Tywin allows her to not marry Loras because their alliance is still strong enough because Marjorie is queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So House Tyrell should be okay at this point with Sansa not marrying Loras. All right. I need a little last to admire Loras, though. Let Sel get in there. Yeah, yeah. Loras would be happier. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get some sword play. You, you practice your sword play, Lancel. You're marrying Loras. <laughs> I need a little Aston right now. So it's up to you to find a female here that can marry Loras. <laughs> what about Lancel? <laughs> the Queen of Thorns, she knew about Loras's preference for young men that might have worked we have the first homosexual marriage <laughs> in westeros history it's not approved of by the faith but it's approved of by the crown 
I think Tywin would have relented. Actually, I don't know, man. It's a tough call. Cause Tywin's Tywin. He does what he needs to do, and I don't know. It's like the irresistible force meets the immovable object. They're both so headstrong, but it's just that Tywin actually uses his head right. in, a, in a better way than Cersei. Both the, both the power play moves. Which power play would have moved first? Yeah. And how far would it have gone? Cersei's refusal to marry Loras. Would she have gone public with her relationship with Jamie? I don't know, because she doesn't later on. When she is in control, full control, with Tywin out of the picture, she doesn't go public with her relationship to Jamie, which is weird because most people know about it anyway. Real quick before we get into season five, looking at Cersei's relationship with her family, her immediate family, her siblings and her parents, we don't know what her relationship was like with her mother, but we know that when Tyrion was born, that killed Joanna Lannister. Mm -hmm. And she's always held that against Tyrion. So you got to assume that she had a good relationship with her mother for her to be that angry at Tyrion. But her anger at Tywin, it grows from season two climaxing in season four. But when he's dead, that anger doesn't go away. She then like doubles down on her anger at Tyrion, even though Tyrion's not there. But she puts her anger, all that anger she had at her father, she just adds that to her anger at Tyrion, offering lordships to whoever can bring her Tyrion's head. Mm -hmm. If you remember in the books... I think they kind of mention it in the in the show. Like they definitely mention it where they they bring like a dwarf head. Yeah, right? they do that in the show. Yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, her relationship with Jamie it doesn't intensify. Maybe it cools off a little bit for all the emphasis she put on Jamie while Jamie wasn't around. Now he's around, and it's not that important to her. Having power and rule over the Iron Throne is more important to her than her relationship. With Jamie, who is the one Lannister that she's not really angry with. It's kind of interesting, and I think it goes to further my thesis that she doesn't really care that much about her family at all. She's kind of a, a bit of a sociopath. Only cares when she needs to care. Right. And I used to make the argument that her and Catelyn Tully are a lot alike because they both are more concerned with their own hold on power than they are about the good of their family. And I used to make the argument that at least Cersei's honest about that, whereas Catelyn's not. Yeah, she kind of hides it. Yeah. But in a way, Cersei's not honest about it either. I still have more respect for her than I do Catelyn, but they're a lot closer than I even initially thought. So season five, I guess she gets a, a letter from Dorne about the death of Oberyn, and she takes that as a threat. So she sends Jamie. No, no, she gets, um, she gets that viper snake thing that has the necklace that Marcella has. So she takes that as a threat that Marcella's life is in danger. And they decide, well, we can't, we can't go to Dorne because then that's gonna be like, it's going to be like a sign of, a, of an act of war. So Jamie's like, I'll go there like on a one man recon match. I don't think they have the, the manpower to do it either. Oh no. They make such a stink about needing House Terrell's army because theirs was pretty much decimated fighting Rob Stark and Stannis. The Viper with the necklace, that's not very, that's not a very Dorne Martell move. I don't know if you remember, was it actually Dorne Martell that sent that, or was it Illyria Sand? Illyria Sand. It is her that sends it. I'm, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I, th- I thought that's who it was. Well, it'd be downright silly for Benioff and Weiss to make it Dorne Martell that sends it. They gutted those characters, and I understand they had to, to a certain degree, but that would just be overkill, not Dorne Martell at all, when the simplest solution would be Illyria Sand sends it. Yes, it's Illyria, because I remember... Uh- doesn't Jamie talks to uh, Dora Martell? Doesn't he say like, "Well, we got you"? Right. And then like they then like Dora realized, "Well, that wasn't me." They looked the camera pants to Laria. <laughs> She's like, "Oops, <laughs> sorry about that." <laughs> <laughs> so Cersei's main plot in season five is the Faith of the Seven, the High Sparrow. I forget how she hears about this guy, or maybe she just hears that somebody's preaching in. The shanty part of King's Landing. Flea Bottom? Yeah, Flea Bottom. This guy in like rags is preaching in Flea Bottom and he's got a lot of followers. So she concocts this plan. She goes down to speak to him and they don't really get into the politics of the Faith of the Seven and the new High Septon. And I don't remember if the old High Septon was... Now, he wasn't killed in the riot in the bread riots. He's killed that season, if I remember correctly. I can't remember that. I can't remember what right there. Yeah, I think he's killed that season. Because I remember he's at a small council meeting asking for bodyguards. She says something like, well, the the seven will protect you or whatever. And then he ends up getting killed by followers of the High Sparrow or the guy they're calling the High Sparrow who never really has a name. 
she meets with the High Sparrow, and she makes him High Septon. Right, because she thinks he's playing the game, and Cersei thinks that he's going to be on her side, and then next thing you know, they, he pretty much like arrests Cersei. Right. Well, first, her plan is she tells him that Loras Tyrell is a homosexual. He had relations with Renly Baratheon, and that Marjorie Tyrell knew about this. So they both get arrested, and they're out of her way, because- we also get the wedding of Tommen to Marjorie, who takes Joffrey's place. He's now the king of Westeros, king of the Seven Kingdoms. Marjorie continues what she was doing with Joffrey, which is trying to alienate Tommen from Cersei. And she has more success with Tommen because she sleeps with Tommen, I believe, before their wedding night. I think before they're married, she she sneaks into Tommen's chambers and sleeps with him. Tommen will do whatever she says. And she suggests to Tommen, send your mother back to Casterly Rock. Your grandfather's not around anymore. Jamie's got to stay here. He's in the King's Guard. Tyrion's gone, so somebody has to rule Casterly Rock. Send your mom. And Tommen is willing to do that, suggesting to Cersei that she goes back to Casterly Rock. And Cersei's like, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I got to stay here to, to help you. Tommen's pretty much saying, I don't need help. This even goes back to the season before, before Tywin's death, when he puts his arm around Tommen and he's going to help Tommen rule, mm-hmm. pushing Cersei out of the picture. Mm-hmm. And Cersei, she can't stand that. And she knows that this isn't Tom and it's Marjorie. She concocts this. It's not a harebrained scheme, but it's not a very well thought out scheme. A scheme on the fly. But she thinks it's like a Tywin Lannister level scheme. Oh, yeah. and it's not at all. We're going to get the, Mar- We're gonna get the Tyrells out of here. If she had read any of her history, she'd understand part of the deal with the High Sparrow is he'll become High Sept and... and he can reinstate the Faith Militant. If she read any of her history, she would see how much trouble the Faith Militant had been to the Iron Throne. When you do finally read Fire and Blood, you'll see how much trouble the Faith Militant was to the Iron Throne. It was like a lot of trouble. Her plan seems to work because Loras is arrested and Marjorie's arrested. But there's one fly in the ointment, if you will, and that's good old Lancel Lannister. A new haircut. <laughs> new haircut has somehow become a radicalized follower of the Faith of the Seven. Great. <laughs> I think she even confronts him before he spills the beans about everything and says, like, silence is a good way of worship or something to that effect, saying, like, don't you dare say anything about anything at all. But he does. And he tells the High Septon that he had relations with Cersei while Robert was alive. I believe, although I'm not sure that he tells his High Septon that Cersei had incestual relations with Jamie. But I'm not sure how much Lancel knew about that. So I'm not sure that he did that. But he definitely told the High Septon that Cersei ordered him to give Robert the strong wine, which resulted in him missing his thrust and getting gored by his by the boar he was hunting. So she goes to visit Marjorie, and Marjorie's like, you know, you're a bitch, you're enjoying this, blah, blah, blah. And on her way out, she gets arrested. Did you feel bad for her in that scene when she's nope. arrested? No, see, this is like where a lot of people like start feeling bad for Cersei. Sympathy, yeah. Yeah. She definitely had it coming. I'm less sympathetic to her in Game of Thrones than I am in the book. In the book, at least, it's her point of view. I just remember that chapter and I'm like, I wanted her to get away as much as I didn't like her for the things she did. Just being in her point of view, I wanted her to get away. Obviously, she doesn't get away. She's locked in a cell. Every time she falls asleep, they wake her up by pouring water on her face This is in the books, at least. I'm not sure how much they express this in the show, but they wanted her to admit to her crimes. Quyburn comes to visit her. A subplot the entire series was experiments that Quyburn has been doing on the mountain. The mountain didn't die, but he was close to death. Who I still think the mountain's head is actually Robert Baratheon's head. Really? Yep. Interesting. A.K. Robert Strong. Yeah, but they don't call him Robert Strong in Game of Thrones. No. It's It's still known that he's the mountain. I guess knowing that Quyburn's close to, for lack of a better word, resurrecting Sir Gregor, she feels that she'd be safe with Sir Gregor. She admits to her crimes. Yeah, she, she needs the protection. Sir Kevin comes to visit her also in the show. Does he? I don't know. He does in the books. He may not in the show. She learns that Sir Kevin's been helping Mace Terrell rule. Uh, you know what? I'm confused. I'm getting the two storylines confused. I mean, the important thing is Cersei knows she needs to get back to Tom and she knows that Sir Gregor is back and can protect her from pretty much everything. So she admits to her crimes, takes the walk of shame, and there will be a trial for her. 
I guess she feels okay about that because she knows that Marjorie and Loris' trial will be before hers. Mm-hmm. I like season five. There's just that lasting scene with her when she get, does the trial of the walk of shame and she gets carried, carried, you know, she gets carried off by uh, the mountain. Yeah. Her acting in that walk of shame, even though they used the body double, mm-hmm. she was nominated for an Emmy for that season. I think for a previous season also, but she deserved to win. When she goes to tears, that was her breaking point. She survived it, and it's not that her character went in a different direction, but I don't want to put this. Any reservations she had about going like full-on evil or balls to the walls with whatever her plan is, any reservations that she had prior to the Walk of Shame, they all disappeared yeah. with the Walk of Shame. Now, it's game, set, match. Yeah. Like, she wasn't a new character afterwards, but she was way more intense about what she was doing. And that's how we leave her in season five. And season six picks up, even though she went through the walk of shame. It's not that her character is in a bad way, but her proximity to the Iron Throne, her proximity to her son, Tommen, that's in pretty bad ways. Kevin Lannister is, I think he's protector of the realm. I think he's the regent. Mm-hmm. I think Mace Terrell was named Hand to the King. However it is on the show, Kevin Lannister isn't letting Cersei anywhere near Tommen, and he's, again, told her to go back to Casterly Rock because, and he even goes so far as to disown her. I like that part of Kevin, but I don't think it's as effective in Game of Thrones because we don't see him after season one. We don't see him at all until he shows up again in season five. Tommen apologizes to Cersei for not helping her while she was locked in a dungeon at the Sept of Baelor. She learns that Marjorie is going to do a Walk of Atonement also. I was trying to figure out why she does this. But she conspires with the small council, at least the small council that will talk to her. She conspires to have the Tyrell army march on the Sept of Baylor to free Loras and Marjorie. Mm-hmm. That doesn't work. Marjorie kind of leaned into the punch with the intention to merge the Faith of the Seven and the Crown by convincing Tommen that he should merge the Faith of the Seven with the Crown and give the Faith of the Seven a voice in ruling the Seven Kingdoms. I guess that's a good move on Marjorie's part because it frees her. Right. In a way, it also makes her more powerful because if she goes all out religious and if she is viewed as, for lack of a better word, the ambassador between the crown and the faith, it gives her more power. This infuriates Cersei. But what I don't get, I do after thinking about it, but why would Cersei conspire to free Marjorie and Loras? How does that benefit her? You would think it benefited benefit her more if, if Marjorie had to do a walk of atonement. Yeah, it, I'm trying to think about that right now. Why... The only thing I can come up with is Trells would be responsible for the bloodshed. Right. She wants her revenge against the High Septon and freeing Marjorie and Loras would give her, maybe give her a bit of control over Marjorie. Her son wants Marjorie back, so it would, it would be something that maybe gets her back in good standing with Tommen. That's really all I can think of. But I think that's enough to justify it. But we don't know because... Like I said, Marjorie, she leans into the punch. Cersei still has to stand trial. Well, that, that's probably why. If she can use the Tyrell army to destroy the High Septon and the Faith Militant, right. she wouldn't have to stand trial. And Marjorie probably knows that too. She outmaneuvers Cersei. <laughs> well, ultimately she doesn't, but... Right, at the time, it's an outmaneuver. <laughs> right. It's an outmaneuver right. of Cersei. Because nobody knows of Cersei's plan B, which nobody thinks she's capable of. And that's hinted at a few times in season six before she actually goes through with it. So she thinks she has to stand trial. She's going to demand trial by combat, name Sir Gregor her champion. When in doubt. <laughs> when, yeah, when in doubt. Um, <laughs> I'm sure this was her thinking when she agreed to the Walk of Atonement. Admit to this, but then I have to have a trial. I'll demand trial by combat. Quyburn says he's almost done turning Sir Gregor into a Frankenstein. Right, um, and, th- and then Tommen comes out with a the rule there'll be no more. Yeah, Tommen abolishes trial by combat. It's going to be replaced with a trial by the seven Seven judges, each one representing one representing the father, the mother, crone, the warrior. I just remember that scene when he does that and Cersei's face and how stone cold it but there was still emotion in her. Lena Headey, seriously, season five, season six, even season seven, just a master acting class by Lena Headey. Cersei's okay with that because she has a plan B, which is pretty solid. Probably she's should have got, been a plan A. She, yeah, she's got contingency cons- plans all over the place. So her plan B was dependent on the rumor that there were caches of wildfire underneath the Sept of Baylor. And 
it turns out there were, and Quyburn found them. Do you think, even if she was allowed a trial by combat, which Sir Gregor surely would have won, do you think she would have still done her plan B with the wildfire? Um, I think she would have. If, if they didn't back down, if like, you know, if, you know, if they would have came after her again or something. Yeah, I don't know. I think she would have done it anyway, because even though she was willing to free Marjorie and Loras using the Tyrell army, that was because she wanted the High Septon and uh, Septa Eunice, the one that kept waking her up and, and uh, torturing her while she was in the dungeon. Mm-hmm. Whatever that Septa was, she wanted her revenge against them. But then there's still Marjorie and the Tyrells, all these people she thinks are her enemies, who are, whether she made them her enemies or not. They are her enemies. I still think she would have, maybe not to the scale that she did it, but I still think, and by scale, I mean eliminating as many people as she right. ends up eliminating. I still think she would have done the wildfire to take out the Sept of Baylor and the Faith Militant and the High Septon. But as it turns out, she's supposed to arrive for her trial. And it is rather silly that Faith Militant doesn't go to escort her there. They just take right, it on good right. faith that she's <laughs> going to show up. Oh, she's always been a law-abiding citizen. She'll come here. You know, she, we don't have to worry. Like Kevin Lannister goes there and he's like, uh, oh, I guess, all right, so you're going to follow me there? All right. Yeah. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you when you get there. But she does not show up for her trial. Everybody else is there, but she's not there. It's not like a plot hole. It's just, eh, it doesn't make too much sense. That scene. Oh, man. That is, that is some crazy stuff. And as much as I love the Battle of the Bastards and I think of the, we'll talk about more when we get to Jon Snow and Sansa, but. I do think the Battle of the Bastards is the best of the three big battles we had up till season six, being the Battle at the Wall, Blackwater, Mm -hmm. Battle of the Bastards. I think that's the best one. But even so, that the scene of the wildfire and the Great Sept of Baylor is so well executed. And even coming right straight off the back of the Battle of the Bastards, I think it outdoes the Battle of the Bastards, at least in shock factor. Definitely in shock factor. I did not see that coming. Even though they hinted at the wildfire throughout that season, I did not see that coming at all. And the editing, Raman Javardi's music playing throughout, edge of my seat, bro. I will never, ever forget the first time I saw that scene. And it still has an effect every time I rewatch it. It is masterfully done. And again, Lita Heedy's acting is really the anchor of all of it. What are your thoughts on that scene? I guess like it's you're just wondering if it's actually going to go off. Is it actually going to happen? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, is, you know, like, so will stop that it's not going to go off. The only thing I didn't like about it was, like, it just seemed to have stopped. Like, shouldn't it have... Oh, kept burning? Should've, yeah, shouldn't have kept on going. Mm-hmm. They thought the whole entire... Uh, it should have burned the whole city. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess once Quiburn found the cachet, he made sure there was no wildfire anywhere close other than that cachet. It did burn a lot, probably the whole surrounding neighborhood to the Sept of Baylor. Quiburn's a smart guy. He probably took precautions and they figured he did whatever calculation to figure out what area would burn and where it would probably stop. It's possible that all of King's Landing should have burned, but I could just make the argument that Quiburn did whatever math, whatever engineering mm-hmm. he had to do to make sure it didn't. And then that follows, then that follows up with the scene of Tom and jumping out the window, which is like, holy shit, you know? <laughs> oh God, he's dead. <laughs> God, God. Get somebody down here. I'm serious. <laughs> we need an ambulance. So Tommen kills himself. And even though he is technically a Lannister by blood, he is the last, he was the last member of House Baratheon on paper. So House Baratheon is officially extinct with the passing of Tommen Baratheon, first of his name. And then it's fine. I'm okay with it. And mostly because I can't, I can't figure out the succession. Cersei's crowned queen of the seven kingdoms. I mean, who else would be, who, who succeeds Tommen? You know, who is his heir with everyone that died? Marjorie would be the queen. They had no kids. There's no more Baratheons. I, I read someone looked it up and it actually said that it would, it would actually, and maybe it's the reason how it goes to Cersei, at least Cersei's thinking is, that it would actually go to Jamie. But since Jamie's part of the King's Guard, he can't have Right. Oh no, he was actually he was actually kicked out of the King's Guard. Oh yeah. So it would actually it would actually be Jamie. But Cersei, you know, 
Yeah. <laughs> I guess the point is who's going to argue with her. Yeah. She takes the Iron Throne by proximity. She'll make that her justification as she's the closest to it as far as uh, family lines, as far as position in the small council hierarchy. She is the queen regent. Small council's all dead, except for Quiburn. Quiburn don't want it. You can look at it that way and it makes sense. It's always something I tried to figure out and I just can't figure it out, like where where the succession goes. After Tywin, there was the hand of the king, right? It has something to do with Tywin. With Tywin? Yeah. It has something to do with, like, it would go to like, the hand of the king, so that would go to his his kids. Okay. I mean, I guess that makes sense. But the last, I mean, well, the last hand of the king then was either Mace Terrell or- Right. That's what I'm saying. That doesn't make any sense. But they're all dead, I guess. I guess the last, you know, well, Tywin is also, so I, I don't know. Like this. Kevin Lannister's only kid was Lancel. Any other Lannisters besides Cersei and Jamie, they don't really include in the show. And why would they get it over Cersei or Jamie? Listen, it's, it's a minor thing and it makes sense for the story. Do you think that's where they're going in the Song of Ice and Fire? Probably not, right? Because they, Aegon. Yeah. That's just, that's just the wild card. You said it before, like they gave Cersei part of fake Aegon's storyline, right? which makes sense, but the whole wildfire thing, that's what gets me. How does that get worked into the Winds of mm-hmm. Winter? So anyway, season seven, Cersei is queen of the Seven Kingdoms. House Lannister has won the War of the Five Kings. That said, when season seven starts, her rule of the Seven Kingdoms is tenuous at best. Is probably more tenuous at the beginning of season seven than when four other guys called themselves king outside of King's Landing. But even during the War of the Five Kings, when Balon was king, Rob Stark was king, Renly was king, Stannis was king, Joffrey was king, I feel like House Lannister had better control over Westeros than they do at season seven. Right. When there's less, when there's, when there's, <laughs> when there's less pawns in the way, they, they yeah. struggle. Less competition, but yeah. their hold, hold is worse. But that's because the competition is better now, right? So House Frey, that was their ally in the Riverlands, and they had control over it. But Arya Stark single-handedly takes out <laughs> what's probably the biggest noble family in Westeros single-handedly in like one night. So the Riverlands is in total upheaval. The Vale and the North, they're calling Jon Snow their king. And then Dorne and the Reach, they put aside their differences and they declare for Daenerys Stormborn, who has all of a sudden landed on Dragonstone and retaken the ancient seat of House Targaryen. Tough time for Cersei. But then she gets another wild card. Mm hmm. She forms an alliance with House Greyjoy. Euron Greyjoy. How does this happen now? She just invites him to King's Landing? I guess she writes to him, invites him to King's Landing. Right, right, right. He wants a marriage alliance. She does not want to marry him, but she doesn't tell him that. She tells him, it isn't for, like, bring me Ilaria Sand and I'll marry you. I guess it's help me help me win these wars and I'll consider marrying you. Yeah, if you destroy all my enemies. Help me destroy my enemies, right. So what else was season seven, man? That seems to me on the outset, that's a mistake by her to form an alliance with Euron Greyjoy. It's like a Tyrion Lannister type move. Short term. Yeah. Short term success for long term failure. Yeah. The short sightedness that Tywin Lannister didn't have. It's got its own wisdom to it, but they're just not looking at the big picture the way that Tywin could. And it doesn't seem like either her, and we'll get into Tyrion more when we talk about Tyrion, but it doesn't seem like either one of them learn from mistakes they've made in the past. Right. Yeah. They, they keep on doing it. Which is interesting and adds fuel to the fire of the Tyrion heel turn. We'll talk more about that when we talk about Tyrion, but as far as Cersei in season seven, she makes that alliance. Euron does capture Illyria's sand for her, and she enjoys that revenge, right? She poisons Tyene sand. Mm-hmm. She keeps Illyria alive so she can watch her daughter die the same way that Marcella died, which is a- uh, Death by poison. Yeah, I, I can understand that revenge. And I was kind of into that because I didn't like Illyria's sand. Not that I liked Marcella or didn't like Marcella, but the way she died, Illyria Sand deserved what she got. But it seems like that was what Cersei was most concerned about. Meanwhile, there's a queen south of her and there's a king north of her. The lands around her are in chaos, but she's most concerned with her revenge against Illyria Sand. Mm -hmm. So then from there, I mean, the most important 
part of Series 7 for Cersei is the Dragon Pit meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And we've talked that one to death, but just to go through it one more time, she outright refuses the alliance because she's more concerned about Daenerys and the coming battle of her taking King's Landing. Even when she sees the white, the zombie, the dead that has risen, even when the mountain tries to kill it but can't, She's still more concerned about her hold on the Iron Throne. And she asks Jon Snow. She doesn't even ask him to bow down to her. She just asks Jon Snow to not... Bow down to Danny. Right. Which is interesting. And Jon Snow, being Ned Stark's son... Can't lie. You know, he can't do a white lie. It's, it's not quite a white lie. But he can't lie at all. And he says, I'm sorry, you Grace. I already declared for Daenerys. I'm not going to lie to you. And she's like, all right, well, good luck with your fight. She storms off. It's almost as if she knew that John was going to be honest and that lie. You think so? Yeah. It's almost as she knew. What do you think happens if Jon Snow agrees if Jon Snow does lie? Or if Jon Snow hadn't declared for Daenerys yet? I still think she still wouldn't really help. Like, she'll bash, she'll, she'll stand in the back. But instead, she'll do what she eventually did, which is say she'll help. Yeah. And then not, yeah. Yeah, probably. But her outright refusal gets everybody mad at Jon. Womp womp. And then Tyrion decides to go in and speak with her. Another great scene by great actors. Probably the best scene for Lena Headey in season seven. It doesn't appear that way, the way it's edited, even the way it's directed. But it is, looking back at it, left open-ended. We don't know what the conclusion of that conversation was. We do know that Cersei comes out and says that she'll help. But she doesn't say that to Tyrion in the conversation. We just get her Mm -hmm. laying the guilt on Tyrion refusing to kill him when he gives her the chance to. And then we don't know what the conversation was. We know that Tyrion has tremendous guilt for what happened to Marcella. We know that from past seasons, we know that Tyrion never bets against his family. We know that Cersei says that she has great love for her family and will do anything to protect it. And that's really what we get out of that conversation. We get no agreement or no plan, at least to us, the viewers. The conversation it doesn't really end. It's left to the imagination, like, you know, okay, what was what was said? But looking back on it, it's done in such a way that- Gives them options. Yeah, like you could put any ending to that conversation you can imagine off screen. It does kind of add a lot of fuel to the Tyrion heel turn fire, so to speak. Or at least it does nothing to prove otherwise that Tyrion may betray Daenerys and Jon. We'll get into more about that when we talk Tyrion, but- mm-hmm. I don't think Cersei's the type of person that would fear, I'm not putting this right, her relationship with Tyrion up to that point, there's no reason for her to tell him, yes, I'll help. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And there's no way, well, anything's possible, but- How can she trust her if she has a play? How can she trust him? Right. If, if she thinks he killed Joffrey, number one. Number two, I don't think there's anything that Tyrion could say to convince her to help out. So why would she, she she's not going to say she's going to help out to Tyrion if she's not going to help out. I don't think. But then they all come out. She agrees to the alliance. And then we get another very solid scene with her and Jamie to end season seven. Love that scene. And it should also be noted that she's pregnant at this point in time. It's hinted at, and then it's outright said that she's pregnant in that scene with Tyrion. So she's got a baby Lannister on the way. Jamie is the father. Jamie doesn't know it. Does Jamie know? What, that she's pregnant? Yeah. Yeah, she knows. Does he? Yeah, she tells him. Okay. She's telling uh, early in the season. Oh, okay. I misremembered. But either way, Jamie thinks they're on board with helping out. He's excited. Yeah, he's going through battles, you know, strategies and how they're going to go up north. Plus, he knows that finally, this time he's on the right side. There's no conflict. This is the right thing to do. And it's warfare is what he knows best. Clear conscience. He's all about it. But Cersei's like, you really are the stupidest Lannister. What are you crazy? We're not going to do that. We're going to sit tight here because if they can't defeat them, you know, if they can't defeat them without us, mm-hmm. we're not going to be able to defeat them either. So our best option is to conserve our strength, stay here and try to wait it, wait it out. And, you know, it's all the way at the wall. And if you think about it, if you're in King's Landing, if you're in the South, the wall is so far away. It's just like, you can't even imagine anything that happens up there would affect you in King's Landing. I know it's wrong, but I understand Cersei's thoughts on the matter. What say you? Well, you can't trust her. I mean, you can never trust her. Say so. It's you know, no. But her thought process with not helping. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You just can't like her herself thought process. Yeah, um, her own justification. Well, it just all goes back to like 
if you're not with us, you're against us, and we'll just take on, we have whoever we take on, we'll take on just to win. But I don't think she really realized the great, how much danger there really are on the other end. Yeah. I don't think she really realized that there's like millions of the, of the undead. I don't know if I'm going to put blame directly on Benioff and Weiss because they are at this point in their storytelling, they're mm-hmm. winging it, so to speak. You know, they have a, an end game, obviously, but I don't see George doing a scene like the Dragon Pit because to bring one white down to King's Landing, I don't know how much that proves. To see one of them, I don't know if that necessarily paints the picture of what reality is. Mm-hmm. Like if Cersei could see the hundreds of them, that'd be a different story, maybe. But just the one, I don't know how much of a danger, how much right. that makes Cersei feel like she's in danger. And then, of course, the last note about season seven and Cersei's storyline is her plan with Euron Greyjoy. Oh, also, the the Iron Bank plot line. Oh, yeah. Crap, crap about that. The Iron Bank is demanding their money back, and they don't have it. So she sends Jamie to Highgarden, destroys House Tyrell. Mm-hmm. And takes their coffers, take, takes their wealth, which she uses to pay back the Iron Bank and- Then she gets into the loot company. Mm-hmm. Euron Greyjoy looks like he's just going back to the Iron Islands. Mm-hmm. But he's not. He's going to hire the Golden Company and bring them to Westeros, which is a fact she does not share with Jamie until after the fact, which kind of alienates Jamie from her. Yeah, it's like, you know, because well, that, that, that's her revenge because Jamie spoke to Tyrion, you know- she justifies it to him with that, but I think she would have done it anyway. Right. And not told him. So that's it. I mean, that's pretty much her plot line in series seven. Two things, first being Lena Headey, which we already touched on. And as far as overall casting for Game of Thrones, I don't know that there's that they did a much better job than Lena Headey. We talk about what's his face as Jorah Mormont. That was a real good casting. Ian Glenn. Yeah, Ian Glenn is Jorah Mormont. And also Alfie Allen. Yeah. Yeah. I like his interpretation of Theon, but I think, look, I, I think even if you read the books, he would have done a better job. I don't think he did a bad job, but I don't think he's on the level of Lena Headey, Ian Glenn. Nikolai Kostrowal, though. Yeah, he's up there also. Although I wasn't sold on him in the first season or the second, but third season onward, he became Jamie Lannister. And I think that's what I mean, is which casting was that character from the get-go? And I think Mark Addy as Robert Baratheon, Sean Bean as Eddard Stark. Ian Glenn as Jorah Mormont and uh, Lena Headey as Cersei Lannister are like the four where it's they were those characters that I envisioned from the get go, you know, from from episode one. Mm-hmm. And where Lena Headey may be better than the rest of them is that her physical appearance is a lot different than the way Cersei is described in the book, and her take on the character of Cersei, she finds a depth to that character that we don't get to until Cersei point of views in the Feast for Crows. So I think maybe pound for pound, all things considered, I think Lena Headey's the best performer on Game of Thrones. I think I'm confident saying that. Definitely more consistent, but the most consistent performance. Yeah. I'm going to say sympathy again. I know you don't feel sympathy for Cersei. And I know it's hard to feel sympathy for Cersei, but somehow Lena Headey, even in her most diabolical moments, she is able to get that emotion from viewers. Not all viewers, but I think the majority of viewers do feel sympathy for her. At certain times, even though how many times have we been burned by the character feeling sympathy for her, for her to come back and do something even more devious. I think that's all credit to Lena Headey, more so than the writing. The writing's not bad, but it's really her performance that's it's outstanding. And the fact that she hasn't won an Emmy, it's almost criminal. It's like Scorsese with the Best Director Oscar. It's a brief overview of Cersei. She's evil at times, and she is sympathetic at times. But I think the key things about her, the way she put her father on a pedestal and her desire to be respected the way her father is. I forget who, who said that about her, but it's a character from A Song of Ice and Fire said Cersei thinks she's Tywin with tits. And in some ways she is, but in many ways she isn't. And it's that short-sightedness that does her in. What's most interesting and probably most, I don't want to say depressing, but she's got that mantra of protect House Lannister. Anybody that isn't us is our enemy. But with the exception of Joffrey, she's alienated all the people in House Lannister. You could start with Robert Baratheon. He's not part of House Lannister, but that was her lord husband. She totally alienates him. Tyrion, Lancel, Kevin. Tyrion, yep. Lancel. Tywin at the end. Tommen, to the point where he kills himself. 
I think at the end of series, at the end of season seven, Jamie. Yeah. The last, the last, really the last, you know. The last ally. The last real ally. Yeah. So who is she really protecting? Herself. Yeah. Like what is she really doing with all this? If you looked at her from a, from like a psychologist's point of view, she's a highly functioning sociopath. She can't sympathize with anyone else but herself. And that's the tragedy of her character. Whatever's going to happen to her at series seven, she's got a lot of that narrative justice coming her way. Series eight, you mean eight? Yeah, season eight, my bad. She's got a lot of narrative justice coming her way. And almost none of it is from outside factors. It's all decisions she made and it's all things that she did Mm -hmm. of her own accord, creating situations in which she could be diabolical, in which she could be evil for no reason other than to get herself closer to power. If there is a sympathetic part to it, it's that she refuses to be a pawn, like we said before, in the Game of Thrones. She especially refuses to be a pawn just because she's a woman. In her mind, she wants to be just like her father or just like Jamie to have the ability to be a player in the Game of Thrones. The only time she wanted to be a pawn was when she wanted to marry uh, Rhaegar. How old was she when that happened, you know? Yeah. 16 years before the events of Song of Ice and Fire? 14 years. It's about 14 years since Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, a couple years, though. Yeah, so like 16. And they tried, and she attempted, wanted to get married. Well, oh, well, duh. So the age of Jon Snow, is, that's like the end of Robert's Rebellion. Is Jon Snow's birth right around there. What do you think of her character? I mean, do you not think it's one of the more interesting characters in A Song of Ice and Fire? It's definitely for the show purposes, because I'm not sure what's going to happen in the books. Yeah. Like, I'm really surprised that she's still been able to be around this long with all the stuff that she's done. Hmm. Of all the stuff that she's done wrong, that she still hasn't gotten the full payback yet. Yeah. Another interesting thing, unlike pretty much all the other characters in Game of Thrones, she hasn't left King's Landing. She hasn't gone anywhere. I mean, other than Winterfell in in episode one, she hasn't gone anywhere. She's been at King's Landing the entire time. And for the most part, in power or very close to being in power the entire time. We'll get into what we think will happen to her at a later episode when we're, we're done with these eight characters, we'll do a, a preparatory episode for season eight with our predictions or thoughts where these characters are going. But for her to be in power for the first seven seasons going into the last season, the smart money says she's not going to end in power. So yeah, she's short-sighted, but at the same time, she's very cunning and she is very cutthroat. She does know how to play the Game of Thrones at the very least. She's no Tywin Lannister, but she's survived where Tywin hasn't. That's to her credit. What else you got with Cersei Lannister? Well, I'm trying to think if there's any, like, scenes we might have missed. You know, like, I'm sure there's something. I'm sure there are also. I think we got all the major scenes. I think I asked you this question before, or possibly you asked me this question. I think it was leading up to the season seven coverage, but I'll ask it again. The differences between the book and the show, the direction the show's gone in with Cersei, how much of that is what they had planned and how much of that is how good Lena Headey is? You think it's just all what they had planned from the get-go? I think they love Lena Headey, so I think they probably have definitely advanced it a little bit. I'm sure some scenes later on were written because of how much they like Lena Headey and how much she's nailed and made this character her own. The combination of Aegon Targaryen's storyline to her, Young Griff's storyline to hers, it makes a lot of sense. I think her fate in A Song of Ice and Fire will be much different. But I will say, you know, at the end of A Dance with Dragons, the state she's in, I counted her out. If Game of Thrones has shown me anything about her, it's that that's probably not a good idea to count her mm-hmm. out. Although I don't see how George wraps this up or combines it with John Connington and Aegon Targaryen. Yeah, like what, what would happen to her if they yeah. take King's Landing? Like, what, what happens? Right. Maybe she she's a hostage. Maybe she helps Daenerys when Daenerys tries to take King's Landing or whatever. There's just so many, there's so many fucking loose ends in the Song of Ice and Fire. I firmly believe that Young Griff will become Aegon the Sixth before he's outed and killed. Well, that's interesting with the number, and this is totally off Cersei topic, but Jon Snow is Aegon Targaryen and fake Aegon is Aegon the Sixth, so Jon Snow is Aegon the Seventh. Yeah, that's how I. But that won't be the case in the show. No, the show also. Leaves out Jahari's the second. Yeah. But just like for the 
book, it's the official title, it makes sense that he he would be the seventh. George loves that number seven, three and seven. And there's something with that number. I, I, I can't overlook that for me. I just can't. Yeah. Well, especially seven, I think even more so, more so than any other number. Seven Kingdoms, uh, Faith of the Seven, Faith of the Seven, Father, Mother, you know, mm-hmm. seven members of the King's Guard, right? Yeah, all right. Next time, we'll be covering Jamie Lannister, your favorite. It, well, in the Song of Ice and Fire, he is my favorite. In Game of Thrones, he's close to my favorite. I don't know actually who my favorite in Game of Thrones is. He's a different character in some ways. In some ways, he's pretty dead on, and I like the characters to be pretty dead on all the time. So Jon Snow may not be my favorite in the books, but I think in Game of Thrones, he might be my favorite. Anyway, thanks for listening. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. Follow us on Twitter, where I'm trying to be way more active on Twitter, at Prince's Promise. Read the Westerosi Companion at the Princes That Were Promised. Dot com. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts. We are on the Google Play Store. We are on Stitcher. We are on SoundCloud. We are on Spotify. You can find us on YouTube. We try to be everywhere. Please subscribe to the show. Leave a review if you can. It's the only way that new listeners will find us. We'll speak with you guys next time. Bum, 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 bum,